appreciate it very much. Uh, the topic I've, I've had today is really a big one, and so I'm going to sort of like skim the surface of a really big uh, topic. Um, and because of my background in sociology, and because as an artist, the two just naturally went together for me. And I really kind of wanted to, to think about, I think sociology has a lot to give us a new perspective on the arts. And it's really, um, a, really a good one. And uh, I, I, I ran across a statement by some artists who, who kind of dismissed it, and I think they were wrong, because I think sociology has a lot to give us new perspectives on what the arts can do. So I, I, I wanted, wanted to start, as I, as I go through this slide presentation with you, and uh, talk um, a little bit. I looked, took, took, looked at this picture of, of, of Picasso, mother and child, and it had so many reverberations from the past. Um, this is Picasso's mother and child here. And I thought it was kind of um, uh, symbolic of so much of contemporary art today. It both references the history. You've got Rembrandt's uh, mother and child. You've got uh, Michelangelo's. You've got all these. Uh, 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 well, of course, doing with quite child, but it also had mother and child as a as a common human theme throughout all different cultures. And Picasso touches so many things in this one painting that I thought it was really kind of symbolic of what are saying, but there, there is a lot here to unpack it. So let me go through this a little bit, and then um, I'll, uh, and then uh, we'll see what you, you'll be able to ask questions. So let me start off, oh, okay, I gotta uh, move to the next slide. Whoop. Whoop. It was working. Uh-oh, I gotta go up here. Little technical problems there. I was working it. I had it down, believe it or not. Okay, let's see if we can do it next. Uh, I had, oh there was one, it's not projecting what I have here. Lyron, don't you have to aim it at the projector? No. Yeah, the projector. It was working. Okay, okay I have it here. I, I, I did it once before and I didn't have it. Yeah. Technical difficulties here. <laughs> this is a way symbolic of, of the modern era. <laughs> uh. How big is that picture, uh, the painting there? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact. Uh, Museum has it, John. Um, I, I don't know. I have. We have the reference of it uh, on the web. So, uh, uh, okay. Oh, right, there we go. Let's see if that will move. Oh, yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. right. So, for those, I I wanted to to start off to talk a little bit about social <laughs> science and the art. So, so. For those who have never taken a course, a sociology course in high school or college, I thought I might explain that sociology is the scientific study of human life. Sociologists are different from psychologists in that they do not generally look at the individual. Their interests are about what people do in groups, in families, institutions, and societies at large. From schools to religious institutions, political parties, family systems, and various kinds of social outlets, sociologists will look at what people do in organized and sometimes unorganized uh, settings to learn what happens, what people are doing. Now, social psychologists study what individuals do and try to explain individual human behavior. Sociologists look at how people, how the group impacts the individual. Anthropologists are also social scientists who generally speak comparing societies and examine the cultural influences that impact them. So there is some overlap. 
But my focus here is, is a reflection of what art does in society and how art changes or influences what we do in the wider society. Social scientists of all types ask how human behavior is shaped, how it changes, and how the largest society reacts. Art is not only a cultural influence, it also in for, it is a form of human behavior that exists on many levels. So it's not only just looking at, at the art, but, but as a form of behavior that people do. My interest in looking at art sociologically is examining how art is a cultural institution and the broad impact that art has on society at large. Since it's a broad topic, covering many aspects of art in our lives. But since I've been both an artist and a student of sociology, both as aspects have fascinated me. And as I, I, I thought this was kind of interesting because when you look, this is, we forget that when we look at a piece of art, we're, we're, we're looking, we're not only looking at the piece of art, in a sense the art is looking back at us. And what that means, and what is the interaction between the two? It happened when I happened to go to Chicago and I went to an exhibit of, um, uh, and I saw a young girl and she took out her cell phone and she took a picture of the painting. And I stood there for a second and I thought, she didn't really look at the painting at all. She just took a picture of it. And I thought, and she went to the next painting, and she took another painting, as if she were trying to own the whole museum. But she never really looked at the pictures. And it kind of like made me just go, wow, what's going on here? So there's a lot going on about art in our culture that is bigger than just merely looking at, at the picture. And that's what sociologists ask. Okay, and now in, the, in a book I happen to was, go, was going through a visual study of the arts, uh, which is a land study sponsored by the Pew Charitable uh, Trust, concluded some data. They were looking at people who go to museums. These data show that although museum attendees are a lot like the po social, the population is, in most respects, they do differ in two important ways. They are better educated and have higher income. The authors of this book note that in a study done by scholar Peter Bordeaux in 1984 that their understanding of the arts influenced how they study, how they look at art. Those who have some familiarity with the arts at an early age tend to focus on the abstract aesthetic qualities of the art, while those who lack this background are much more likely to focus on the literal qualities of a work of art. And that to me is kind of interesting because education is an important factor here. And in a way, it also says something about when you go to a museum. But there are other disciplines. You see, what is surprising to me is that this topic also overlaps many other academic areas and many social science concepts like art history, cultural theory, philosophical ideas about taste, and art museums as social institutions. For example, archaeologists often study pieces of art that they find in many places. Art historians study how art changes over time and place. So archaeologists, they go up and they find a piece of pottery somewhere and they look, hmm, what's this? This is uh, so-and-so, it's the Ming period, or this is that period, and they look at it. And then they look at the context in which that was done. But that's also kind of sociological because in a way of looking at art in the social context that it exists. So, but a lot of this has to go with, a, with the way we've dealt with art history. And I was thinking about this in another context. Our ideas go all, about art go all the way back in Western society to the Greek philosophers like Aero, Aristotle and Plato who constructed the earliest ideas about art and its impact on society. Now when I consider the arts, there's a broad brush here to paint with, if you'll pardon the metaphor. Because if we think about the visual arts, poetry, literature, what we generally consider the humanities, 
we have lots of theories by ancient philosophers, and many modern philosophers too, by the way, about the role of art in society. So not necessarily sociologists, but people are asking, what does art do in society? So, the Greeks, of course, were important. If you're going to talk about Western culture, you're going to talk about the Greeks. Plato, for example, didn't want to have poets in his ideal society because he felt poets were too unconventional and too unruly to exist in his society of order. He had a, he had a whole plan for society. Today, we can't imagine literature without books like the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are key works of Greek literature. Taking this, taking, taking this as a look at art sociologically, how art impacts society as a whole. Early philosophy engaged in such speculation, which influenced most of Western thought. So, you know, there are tons of that stuff out there. You can read lots of that in history. There's lots of that, you know, in Greek and all that. So, it seems to me that when we think of what art is, we generally think about some human expression conveying some personal, probably fictional work in some form that expresses a wide range of feelings conveying various human emotions. While we experience them individually, we often enjoy them collectively, whether in museums, churches, schools, or even outdoors. Art is a collective enterprise, which is not what we usually think of when we think of art. The artist may be the catalyst but the art itself is a collective experience. This is why I speak of art as a sociological experience. It has to do with the range of collective experiences that we share with each other in some cultural form. You go to a concert, you go to a museum, you go to a poetry reading. You go, you're, people just don't do these things individually. So there are various debates about over the works of art that have led to academic disciplines, commenting on what the artist did and what was possibly meant. Art history, for example, looks at the work of art itself and the social conditions in which it was created. If one takes the historical situation as a background, you are then taking into account the fact that people create their works of art in various periods of history, and people express needs, ideas, and social circumstances of the period in which they live. Each of the periods in which the art exists, it's in a different context. It's historical. It's social. And all of that is involved with each other. Art, society, it's like a dialogue. Art, society. So, but why the historical situation is at a critical point in time, it is also a reminder that works of art are not created in a vacuum. It is a reminder that however isolated the artist may be, or however much a hermit he or she may attempt to be, the works of art are social products of the society in which they live. Because they are attempts to communicate with others. That makes it a vital part of social life a part of the activity of what makes art critical to the social fabric of our lives. We may, we, we may experience things individually, but we share them collectively. You do things, you, read a, you pick up a poem, even when you pick up a book, when you really think about it, it's a social event. Because there's an author who wrote it whenever they wrote it, and you're picking up that information, and that's between you and that author, that makes it social. It isn't just individual like we like to think. It's a social experience. But that gives it a wide possibility. And every culture does it a little differently. That's what makes art fascinating. It gives us a fascination. And when you go and you experience the art of that culture, you're getting a little bit of that culture. You're getting experience of what somebody else in some other time or place, what they experienced, what they felt, and they expressed it in the way they expressed it. But this begs another question. What is the role of the art museums? This is what really got me to thinking. Art museums, we think of them, well, our, all the arts have a, a unique role. But this goes for all the arts, of course. But for art pieces that go in public museums, 
when most people see visual art as a public experience, we should look at what take a look at art museums as collections of social institutions that have important social information that is to be shared to the public across a wide range of social classes, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you uh, have a lot of education, whether you don't have any education, whether you have a knowledge of the subject or not. You go to an art museum and you get a whole different kind of experience. This is why we value them so much. But in a way, it also begs the question of what, why, you know, when they first, people that suddenly come up, you know, we got to collect all these things and put them together because they're, they're different. Art museums are a unique kind of institution. They're not, they serve a wide variety of interests. They do a wide variety of things in a wide variety of places, but they're not all the same. And they don't all do this, uh, they all do the same function, but they all don't do it in the same way. So, in a strange way, an art museum is kind of, is kind of, um, a kind of like a, I like to think like the art itself is kind of like a catalyst. It, it does other things. Now, when we think of art museums as social institutions, people of all educational levels go to art museums, and we encourage children and our schools to take, take them there. And why? Is it to look at a few colors on a stretch canvas? No. It is because people see and share human emotions. Learn how people express those feelings and ideas in the past, or how they currently do. And we learn something about our collective social life as a nation, as a wider culture, or to get a glimmer or other understanding of other cultures. An art museum is a wonderful place where you get to open and to see the world differently. When you come into art museum, you come out differently. You're a different person. You see something different that somebody created in a different place, and you, you say, oh, I don't like that piece. That's just horrible. Or, wow, I really like that. Wow, what were they saying? And that itself is a whole other thing. So your, open, your whole mind is opened to a whole range of experiences that you would never get anywhere else. So again, it's a unique kind of institution. It's not exactly like a school where you're going and you're taught things. Because people go in there to have fun. But yet at the same time, they go and they have fun. Now what is it that we go out and look through a wall, we look at these pictures, all look at these things on the wall? Well, that's because we're a visual culture. You can go to places and museums, you can listen to things on, on, on music, or you can go to museums where you, where you can hear, uh, they even let people touch things, the museums where you go and you touch things, and they say, please touch, and go. A normal museum, you wouldn't be able to touch things. So art museums really raise a lot of questions about what kind of institution they are. Very unique, very clever, and like I say, they're not like a school. You don't go and say, okay, you're gonna get a test on, you're looking at Picasso. No, you go to the art museum and you're opened up to a whole new world. Then, sociologists refer to this process as socialization, generally, as we teach the values, human frameworks of life, and emotional expression of the culture and society in which we live. Art museums play a role in this very public way, but they can also be seen as part of a wider social process in society. One can think of art museums as an educational institution, of course, but they are more than that. They also plug into the wider social and cultural fabric that make up modern life. So, for example, the Detroit Institute of Arts recently had an exhibit based on and with costumes from the Star Wars series of movies. Now, while one can see this as popular culture, one can also see it as an appeal to various audiences. Science fiction fans, people who like costumes, they have enormous detail about the costumes and how they created them, and the detail that of work that was put into them, movie set design, the role of popular culture itself. And the museum itself is expanding its appeal to wider, wider audiences than just art buffs. But this leads to another question. Does popular culture influence the art museum, 
or does the art museum influence popular culture? In this exhibit, one can see everything, many, uh, everything, and many background aspects to the whole genre of the movie industry itself. So, you kind of wonder. Now, one could also see that as the movie industry itself is, ex it's, itself is expanding its base too. So the movie industry says, hey, if we go into museums, we can reach more people. They'll want to come to our movies and we'll give them more detail and they'll learn, they'll see more about our movie and, and they'll, they'll, they'll suddenly want to come to it. But movies are another form of art. That's why they have the Film Institute at the Detroit Institute of Art. The intense role that the wider culture and the movie industry impacts also on how we express ourselves can also be seen. But it will also affect the art museums. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the art museums that are influencing the movies or is it the movies that are influencing the art museums? So, you know, this kind of question kind of got me to thinking, gee, you know, there's so much interaction. Art museums are a whole different kind of institution. They open doors to so many possibilities. And then you get, with today's social media, people put their paintings, their drawings, and even sculpture on the World Wide Web for all to see. Boundaries of private viewing and public art are blurring, even as art pieces are disseminated all over the world. You can visit, by the World Wide Web, many museums in many countries. The question is, is this, having a, is this really having an art experience? When you stand in front of a painting, you see the texture of the paint, the canvas, you get the different, you get to look at the grains, you get to see the brush strokes. On the other hand, many people who would never go to museums in other countries can see much of the art in other countries. So this begs another question. What does it mean to experience art? What is the criteria for deciding what's worthy of being seen? Some pieces, I went to one museum and they had this thing and it was just black pieces of stone. Now on one level that's really innovative. On the other question is, okay, people always ask, well, yeah, I couldn't do that. But really, you didn't think of it. So what, what came first? Is it, is it the artist or is it the culture that said, you know, you want to have a, look, a different way of looking at something. So every culture does it a different way. They do a different sculpture a different one way. They do a different painting another way. They portrait something. But every time you look at it, you're seeing a different way to present another way of expressing a different feeling, a different emotion. And you can come out of it looking at it very differently. So I'm going to conclude with this uh, uh, little presentation here briefly. The role of arts in society is a complex thing. This is the tip of the iceberg of the sociology of the arts. This is just opening the door. So I want to uh, sort of uh, uh, work with this uh, to a different way of seeing the arts. Now, see, contrary to what some artists I heard them say was, well, you know, these social scientists are just going around there categorizing things. That's not, the, that's not really the way. When you look at it from a sociological point of view, you see the enormous contribution that the artist is making in society and how society is responding. Music. Take, for example, the fact that, uh, let me give you an example here. Um, here's a book um, that I got by the famous, you can take a look at it, uh, by the artist Escher. Famous uh, artist Escher, there's a commercial, I, I don't know if you've seen it, where a guy goes into a room and he's coming out, and he's coming up going in one room, but he's really going out to the same room. But it was really a, a contribution of Escher. And they really robbed right from Escher, and it's in the commercial. But they don't really give him any credit unless you really know that it was Escher. So Escher was influencing a commercial that people see every day. So art is opening up a different way to look at even our, our commercial. But of course, the commercial is in a sense a piece of art. <clears throat> so again, the, com the chicken and the egg question emerges. The image and the object, which is it? So the sociology of the arts is a useful tool 
as old as it's a tool to look at human social life and grasp the significance of what art is and how art contributes to the wider culture. So I, I think that, I think that uh, in a lot of ways, this is a really um, broad uh, thing to see. We are looking at a new way of looking at the art. Because in the past, you know, when we see that art museums influence what we look at, when we see uh, that uh, our response to the arts are in multi-layers, uh, it begs a lot of questions. And I think that makes the arts richer, not poorer. We're learning new things, and we're also getting a better grasp of ourselves. And we're looking at ourselves new. So I think when you go to the art museum, you go to the DIA, go there, and I challenge you to stop and look at it a little different way. It's a wide world. So, um, I suppose I've uh, gone on for a bit, so I'll open up to questions and a little discussion and see what people have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, which, is, uh, which do you think is the best way of uh, receiving, let's say, art? Uh, <laughs> through mechanical means or through well, yeah. you know, again, this, uh, well, I don't know, you know, both of those have, if, if you think of a computer, it's only a tool. You know, uh, it, I, I suppose in the days when uh, Michelangelo was using camel hair brushes, it probably was, it was probably the most advanced thing of its time. It was innovative, it was, it, people were using different kinds of paints, they were, they were mixing things, they were doing all sorts of things. But I think if you were around today, he probably would be on the computer doing this kind of digital stuff because that would give, he would be using the latest stuff. So, you know, I don't know. It, there's no one best thing. It's all what you do. This is kind of way what we're learning. But it's how our culture is looking at, our, at ourselves and how we're looking at each other. And I think of the artist, Dennis, is kind of like a catalyst. You know, like I said, you know, Thank you, uh, Mayor, for coming. Sorry. Um, so, so, art opens up uh, that way. It opens up. So it, it's just a technique, like one among others, to open up your, the eyes, to open up our perception of new things. When you're yeah. talking about... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Dan. You have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Talking about education, early mm -hmm. education, that really intrigued me. That's all I wanted to yeah, say. Yeah. Well, I, I, this is this is why I think it's so cool, uh, Art Institute, because schools take take the kids to the art museums, and they go, and they just they have fun, and they look at the pictures, and they look at the thing, and they they open up things, and they have um, other um, activity for them, and then you know they don't think that they're learning; they're just having fun. Yeah. But of course, it's really great learning. But at the same time, it's not a it's not you know, you're going to be graded on this. You're going to go out and have fun. At the same time, you'll be learning culture, you're learning history, you'll get a little bit of how to do things. There's a whole variety of things you're learning all at once. So that's why I think we take our kids to art museums, because they're, they're great places for not only education, but uh, getting to see the wider culture. Yeah. I remember thinking about that the film and regular arts of society and Art, it was art influence society. And I just started thinking about it again, that kind of answered my question, is that society had to be there first. Some guy has to communicate something and makes a piece of art. Wow, look at that. And then kind of gets the ball rolling like that. And uh, yeah, it's good to, I think it's good to have a good understanding of this because you can see what some influence that society is having on you, what it's having on art, you make art like we do, that you can turn it around, you know, and come up with something new in advance. So. Yeah, well, <coughs> recent ads by the DIA uh, express this role of education. They talk about how many school kids go there and um, recognize that important role. 
And it's a wonderful function. It's another wonderful function that all art museums do. The DIA does a great job of that. Uh, when I was in Chicago and I saw all these kids lining up, eager to come and see what would normally, you know, uh, drag their tails to school, but they're excited to come to an art museum. And they're, they're learning as much, if not more, when they go into an art museum. And that's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. So, anything else? Yeah. Hey, John, thank you for your talk. I, uh, where do you think, and, and this, this brings up a relevant point that has been made, where do you think the intersection of sociology, art, and what we can define as culture? Like when is, you know, when does it become part of popular culture? And how does that happen? Is there a, is there a sociological nod that happens? Well, you know, that this is part of the this is part of the thing that they explore. When does when does something become popular in the arts? What is popularity? You know, um, you know. How do you explore? You know, like Star Wars is an interesting example when they brought it to the museum. And I, I really thought of it because they showed how they they had a wonderful thing where they they had the the actual costumes from the movie. Then they showed them how they made them. Then they showed them how they researched. They took different uh, cultures and the. They took a little bit from the Indian culture and a little bit from the uh, from the uh, Western culture, a little bit from the uh, Malaysian. I mean, made costumes of three different cultures and put them together, and it fit. It looks like totally alien, but yet at the same time, it was totally appropriate to the to the storyline. But it looked very human, you know. So, uh, so, but what made it popular? You know, the mystery is there. What makes pop? What makes something popular? What is popular culture? One, you know, what, what makes something, um, you know, wildly popular? And why? Do, again, how does the museum fit into that? And how does it feed on it? And should it? Some people say, well, if you get too popular, on the other hand, what is art? But you know, being what's popular, what people are interested in, drawing in the public. If you're gonna try to get them to see the wider culture and to look at themselves differently. You know, it, it, I, I think, I, I don't know of any study that's about popularity, per se. It sure begs the question. If you look at uh, some of work that Dali did, uh, he was influenced a lot by Freudian psychoanalysis with his uh, surrealism, and then also with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. So you kind of package that all and put it into another form and fell apart. Interesting. So. Yeah. Well, like I say, I mean, I mean, has anybody seen that commercial with the with the guy walking in and and he walks into the room and suddenly he's in another room but he's in the same room and it was really it was such a rip off of Escher I I, I couldn't <clears> believe they didn't mention his name at all or something or he put it or something. On. Because it was totally based on his artwork. They altered the, the stairway where the stairways goes up and you're going down and you're going around. And, you know, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting one. Maybe we'll see it. But so, uh, yeah. Another way of asking um, Jared's question is um, Is everything that is depicted art? I mean, uh, I mean, in your talk, you sort of like, this is an art, this is art, this is art, this is art. And so one might want to know where is the boundary? What Could you identify something that is not art? Well, you know, that, that's an interesting question, yeah. Because there are philosophers that say everything is art. Everything is art. Everything is art. But then if everything is art, then in a sense nothing is art, you know? Uh, uh, that, you know, so the boundary of what is art and what is not art isn't always clear, either philosophically or in a scientific way. Usually, and then it's supposed to be something really special, you know. I mean, if something, if, if you make a, make something, you know, the act of doing it, 
but let's say you have 30 people doing it, and one is really special. Like, how did he do that? But it may not be art, you know, but it stands out from craftsmanship or so much above the other. People will go, oh, that really is better than that, and that's so far above it, it's uh, not repetitious, it's, it's special, right? Right? That's, uh, but then again, that doesn't necessarily make it, because you could, uh, every time they come out with a new car, it's different or something. That's newness. Newness is a, is, that's, you could, that could be a, not art, just newer, right? Yeah. Uh, so, it all depends on what you, like anything, what you compare it, and visuals are comparing it, right? This is bigger than that. That's smaller than that, right? Visually. And that gives more feeling or depends on the culture and all that stuff. It's yeah, yeah, what, what's, how you judge, yeah. And the and cultures. So. Yeah, and, and, and again, because, I mean, what the, that, the definition of what those things are, what is art, you know, it's going to vary with the culture, it's going to, but, you know, what is art, you know, if, if you have a cup, uh, you know, is that to make a, a beautiful cup? If you put a lot of work into it, maybe that's art. You really work your best at it. On the other hand, maybe just if you don't, maybe it's the intent, or maybe it's what what makes what could make if you made a if I made it with a beautiful handle, would that be any more artistic? Maybe. But on the other hand, is what is art is is maybe uh, uh, it has a special characteristic. Um, so. These are questions people have been asking for, like I say, it goes all the way back to the Greeks. And one more time, like yeah. Star Wars. I remember when it came out. I ran to the theater, mm -hmm. I saw pictures in the, in the magazines about Star Wars and this gold robot. And I thought, after watching that, I go, well, they stole those uh, World War II fighter scenes. Right mm -hmm. off, I've seen better fighter scenes in these movies on TV than that. And then they had the sword fighting, and there was a kind of a mystery of fantasy going through. I said, that's kind of special. And I go, ah, that wasn't as good as I thought it'd be. And then, it, but a lot of people hadn't seen those things, fighter planes and all that stuff, and then really took off. And the more you give the public, the public gets used to it, right? And you're sharing the experience. Like they told Woody Allen when he first came on the scene. He said, just uh, do your stuff. Now, go, to, go on this show. Now, go on this show. Go dance on this show. And they just fill the screen, fill everything, and then you get used to the person. And you got the rhythm, the beat, like a language. You understand the language and you get hooked on the beat. That's uh, selling it, in a way. A lot of them, like, um, you're saying that cup. Okay. And that reminds me of uh, Andy Warhol with the soup cans, right? Nice. So, okay, now what did that guy do to transform an everyday object into a piece of art? Okay. And I think the Germans have a name for it, Zeitgeist, Spirit of the Times. And that's what the artist tries to capture and then promote. And promote someone to seeing what he sees. You know, and if a lot of people can relate to it, well, then that becomes popular. You can't force an eye, artists can't force an eye. Be but, something. but if you see it all the time, and like museums, if museums put it in there, that are keeping it going, keep that ball going. And, mm -hmm. and Andy Warhol's soup can just making, he thinks the soup can is special, right? He makes it bigger, and it's everyone knows what that soup can is, but he made it special. Everybody look at it; it's big, and on a thing, and it forces you to look at it like that. Yeah. And after a while, you get okay, okay, and then it's boom. It's in uh, your uh, psyche, like you taking something ordinary and making it special on a modern way with a stencil, right? He was doing those all on stencils, 5,000 a piece. In New York, when I was a student, 5,000 bucks, you know, he's rolling those things off. I'm mean, like, what? But that's, he made you aware of a big soup can as a symbol of something, you know, American colors. Yeah, and, and then you see with the with the soup can too. You get the question: He's commenting about American cu culture, American commercial culture. You get, of course, about the brand itself. 
you got about what is branding in American culture? Because now people talk about this is a brand, you know, I, I have this brand. What does that mean? That kind of, I would thought that was kind Elitist. of... Elitist. Oh, I'm sorry. Elitist. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you get involved in what what is all, many different layers. But uh, of course, who was, you know, who was the most controversial artist in his time? Uh, besides Picasso was Andy Warhol. He was, you know, he was almost embodied pop culture. But was he, the, was he the, the pop artist or was he a guy who tried to get his name out there was the most self-promoting artist like Picasso himself? Mm -hmm. So when you get into that idea, where is, where is popularity again? You know, and it, 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 it's, you know, again, it's the impact of society on the arts and the arts impact on society and the two mesh. And it's, it's a whole different way of, of looking at the arts as they interact with each other and they melt with each other. You know, right, there is a movie called um, Rock and Picasso in the movies. And it was about the time that Picasso was getting into his field, that movies also came out. So now it wasn't just two-dimensional, it was three-dimensional. His figures moved. <clears throat> Mobile, yeah. So he kind of picked up on, the theory was he picked up on that to try to add three dimensions into his paintings. Yeah, so it, well, it was supposed to be sort of a mixture of both sculpture and painting. And so w which was it? Was it a painting? Was it a sculpture? What, was it a better design? Uh, what was the role? And it, it really begged other questions. You know, what was the hanging mobile? Uh, you know, uh, so there's a lot going on. There's different layers uh, that are going on that uh, influence how we look at those. I wonder a lot of times artists look for inspiration for a piece of work. So I'm trying to see what, what, what if you took and actually analyzed something you wanted to express and, then, and make it more step by step, you know, a way of making art beyond just inspiration. Whether you can look at it say, from an intellectual point and then wait for inspiration and then do it. I mean, to actually get a more focus on your art and make it. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, a different approach. Yeah. Well, yeah, Dad. Since I'm, I'm an ex teacher, I talk a lot too. So, like before I came here, I, I'm, um, I do murals, you know, and I draw from life. I don't like to use photos. And that stuff. Before I came here, uh, I, I was supposed to collect all the names of people that were in one of my murals in Hamtramck. You all know Hamtramck? Hamtramck? Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's inside well, of Detroit. Yeah, and it's got all these <laughs> immigrant things. It's a museum. So I did this Bangladesh, and, and the lady that's collecting the names says, I, I'm missing four names in the mural. You know, who is this guy? Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, something like that, or something. So I go down to the uh, restaurant that these guys hang out with, and they know him, you know. So I asked the guy, the kid there, I said, well, who's this guy? <laughs> I think it's Dr. Ahmed, but I'm just, he said, I, you know, and he's, he's kind of not, there's no customers. So I said, I drew those, I drew those. He goes, you draw that? Uh, you could draw me? I go, yeah, sit down. So I drew five minutes, you know, bam, you know, got him. All right, like that. Now, his reaction, um, communicating, so he feels good and he sees that, sign that, put a date on that. You know, he's having respect for that. And then he goes make some calls, you know, and that and influences. And I got this name of this other guy, he finds out. And then he takes that. Now that is like communicating at a level that you feel it, like a, a theater person, you know, I mean, that, that sees an audience. And you're communicating, you're seeing how that is, spe is special, someone regards that. It's affecting him, and and it's also part of this, you know, information for a book for a mural. Uh, it's like a language art, and it's more fluid. I mean, because it's personal.
not a machine didn't do this, a human being did this. And, and machines are a bunch of crap, basically. Mm -hmm. Basically, a bunch of crap. They say make it easier, but a machine can't do anything. And if you use a machine, you're using something that is really taken away from yourself, a skill. No matter what you say, what you say, a picture of that, yeah, here's a picture. Well, I could do that. I got a phone. It doesn't mean it. But by hand, it's, it's special. And, it, and if it's accurate enough, and it has those things. And uh, human voice is better than a damn microphone on a, a record. You ever hear a human voice sing? You know? And these microphones are, it's, that's crap. I mean, if you're comparing, it's what you compare, right? So that's what I think about that stuff. And the more you bring it down to a human level, a personal level, where you're actually, and when you look at a painting, that's personal, you see that strokes. Imagine you can take a photograph, digital. Like I said, that's crap. And like I say, people who use that stuff, they're kind of dealing with crap. You know, you gotta go, wait, you have to make money doing that, but it's not the real stuff. There, how about that? <laughs> yeah. John, I want to one more. A common theme here, and a question for you is, have you looked into, what, what part of your research has looked into semiotics? Semiotics? Because oh. semiotics is, is actually everything we're talking about here, whether it's language or, you know, marks yeah. made on a paper or art, you know, these are all symbols. Right, right. Which, which requires, you know, a, a receiver right. to, to interpret, you know, whether individually or as part of the group. So maybe, maybe you'll find something in the semiotic yeah. field that, that helps you with your study. Yeah, well, well, whether we get into signs and symbols, well, there's another, there's a psychology there about, about the art. Signs and symbols, anthropologists, psychologists, they've all studied and look at what, there's a famous painting, I forgot who does it, and it's with a pipe, and it says, this is not a pipe. But it's absolutely right, it isn't a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. So which is it? Is it the pipe or is it the painting of the pipe? Well, that's the big argument of Mark scholars. But the point is, he makes that point. Language and human behavior and communication, that's part of the art function. But it's also, in a way, we communicate deep. See, that's, to me, that's an intellectual level. You know, this is not a pipe. No, yeah, it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. But, on the other hand, when we look at a, a picture of somebody with a beautiful smile, or like I, I had in my, my first uh, thing, we had the painting of the Picasso painting of mother and child. You got a painting of a deeply felt human connection, mother and child. It's been a painting throughout Western culture, mother and child, throughout every culture, religious, secular. It's a wonderful deep emotion, and that deep emotion comes to every pay, every period of history. So yes, it's a symbol, mother embracing child, but then uh, it's a whole new way of communicating. Picasso put it on one level, Rembrandt did it on another level. Everybody tried it, but that would make art interesting. Yeah. Well, that's mother and child. This lecture, when I saw that, that's very human, right? That's mother and child, that's it. But a picture of a pipe, if you put a picture on a pipe on this door and put an X underneath it, what, you're talking now, right? What does that mean? No smoking. No smoking. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And that's where that pipe is, we'll decide, uh, you know, uh, the function of it. Uh, it's got to be a little more clear. And, and since, what do you call that cinematic? You're talking about semi semi That's like metaphors? It's the study of uh, signs and symbols and how, how uh, they work on how our minds understand them. Metaphors, like? The guy it's, looks it's like everything. Captain Kirk. It's really good. Like, if you don't know who Captain this, Kirk is. This is a sign. Like everything, is, really, everything in our world is a sign. That's what semiotics is. Depends on the location and what. Everything is. stands for something like, you know, a cup. Like but it may need more to explain itself, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's a, a frame or a 
museum to put it in, then you, it means something else in a museum than when it's normal function, right? Uh, yeah. Foot, this foot, room foot. here, like when I came in here, I thought this is like a boardroom, right? This is uh, it's all right. Room. It is a boardroom, right? Yes. Yeah. Who comes in here to the workshop? Who sits at these tables like this? A lot of people. Us, important people. <laughs> no, I, I have some know. food for thought for the artists in here. My father-in-law was a <laughs> world-renowned ophthalmologist who developed intraocular lens, and when we went to the museum with him, he would tell diagnose eye conditions from the art. So think about that for a while. This guy had glaucoma. This guy has cataracts. This guy, and he, all these different diseases, macular degeneration. He, and he could tell you at what point their disease was when they drew that particular painting. Well, he didn't enjoy the paintings. He enjoyed diagnosing <laughs> their, their conditions. So when you're drawing, stop think, am I expressing a disease I may have? You don't know. Hell. He just was impressed of that. He has a bedside manner of a porcupine, but he was brilliant. And, but art was not his thing. His thing was diagnosing art conditions, uh, eye conditions from the art. Just thought I'd share that with from you. The art? Yeah, from the that art? That would be called research. Research, yes. Because <laughs> right. Toulouse get, Lautrec had cataracts. You get your data from various sources. Yeah. And Toulouse. that was very enterprising of him. Yes to be able to yes. take data from that source. Isn't it beautiful? Yes, yes. And have you seen pictures of eye diseases? Mm -hmm. You could put a lot of them, when you go and take a picture of the back of the eye when somebody has macular degeneration, mm -hmm. it is very creative looking. Mm -hmm. And he has put them up. And he used to make me sit through those. <laughs> <laughs> Look at, isn't this beautiful? Is it, isn't it absolutely amazing? Wouldn't that be a great piece of art? I was thinking of putting that in the living room. <laughs> Well, that's and a whole were. other discussion. Yes. Really, and art and aesthetics and that whole thing. Well, yeah. I thank everybody for coming today. Yes, really, let's go out. Thank you very much. So, when you're painting next time,